second session of the Age of Enlightenment. And then this one, as I promised last week, uh, we're going to look at neoclassicism, the ancients and moderns, classical models in the age of reason. And uh, we will see why they head in that direction uh, very strongly in this first slide, which I called rationalism versus superstition. The idea of the dark ages, the period that followed the fall of the Roman empire and from the fifth century on, uh, sixth century on, the idea that the middle ages was a period of ignorance and superstition compared to the light of uh, classical Greco-Roman civilization began in the Renaissance with uh, the Italian poem, poet Petrarca. But in that period, the, the uh, interest was in reviving Roman literature, art, and philosophy. Uh, we're going to see as we get into the 18th century that it's going to be much broader than that. Uh, the Middle Ages was associated right from this period with the idea that revelation, uh, biblical text criticism and the like, was a sign of uh, the particular nature of any cultic religion. In other words, Christianity as an example of religious cult was rooted in a particular set of revelations or sacred texts. And by the 15th century during the Renaissance, these texts were now could be subjected to new techniques of explanation and examination, exegesis, and shown to be the products of a particular age, a particular place, and a particular culture. In other words, they weren't universal. They were tied to the life experience of a given people at a given time and place, whether it's uh, the Israelites who just moved out of the Sinai Desert into Israel or whomever, no matter which tradition you chose. So cult worship in that box at the center of the slide was particular to a culture. And by the 18th century, this particularity is seen as arbitrary, naive, and even primitive. It's seen as superstitious. Why would you think that this particular group of people in the desert speaking this particular dialect of this particular language, that their worldview would, would be the one that the rest of the planet should aspire to? And this was at the expense in the eyes of not just the Renaissance figures, but certainly by the 18th century, this was at the expense of classical culture, which attempted universality. And you see that uh, painting that I have in the upper right corner, the triumph of Christianity by Tommaso Laretti, uh, 16th century uh, Baroque art, and what you see is a classical statue that has been sundered at the foot of the cross. And this is pretty much an image that you're, that's gonna characterize attitudes in the 18th century, that Christianity with its naive particular focus, or if you will, Judeo-Christianity, um, was the reason that the classical sense of addressing questions of universal truth was interrupted. They're gonna see this as a superstitious period. That's a dark period. It's gonna be contrasted with, of course, what they thought of as their own age, the age of light, lumière, uh, aufklärung, enlightenment. Now, also, because at this time, the development in the 17th century of physics in particular, but science and the idea of a mechanistic universe suggested that the laws of the universe, the objective laws of the universe, 
could be explained without recourse to the creation myths, whether those are of Christianity or any other religion. And God, in this context, is going to be seen as a watchmaker, somebody who winds up the machine that is the universe. The order of the universe was not lost on them. And Newton's universe was taken as this great machine for which the governing principles could be unraveled by science without the benefit of revelation. And common in this period is a form of religion, which we're going to talk about in a minute, called deism, uh, from the Latin word for God, the deus, uh, the common enlightenment attitude posited that reason an observation of the natural world were sufficient to determine the existence of a supreme being, the watchmaker, but not the particulars of that of any given cult wrapping. The ethical trappings of revealed religion, the ethical teachings were discoverable by reason, by natural faculties. They're going to say that you could, you could extract from religion the ethical messages and leave the, the particular cult worship aspects aside, that those are just particulars that we don't learn and are not tested by science or reason. Uh, one of the great spokespeople for this attitude is Francois-Marie Arouet, Voltaire, uh, sort of the, the godfather of the philosophes in Paris in this period, a uh, preeminent French figure. And he epitomized the Enlightenment attitude towards religion. He was constantly at odds with the Catholic Church. And writings of his were always on the edge of being uh, censored. Uh, he often rephrased things in a kind of elliptical way to suggest, and an ironic and often sarcastic way, to suggest uh, his critique of French Christianity in the period um, to get by the censors. But he wanted to distinguish between the observance of religion in the traditional churches and what he thought of as the natural morality grasped by reason and what he would call good sense. Um, he wrote articles on what he called theism for the uh, encyclopedia, Diderot's encyclopedia. Uh, he believed in the idea that there was a natural religion you look around, every culture seems to have uh, an aspect of religiosity about it. But he believed that you could strip away uh, the sectarian beliefs, the local trappings, the mere cultural add-ons, and get back to a kind of pure, stripped-down, uh, clear, ethically rooted religious sense. And so I quote from him, theism is a religion diffused through all religions. So there's some element in all the actual world religions that's legitimate, he, he wanted to argue. He who thinks that God has made him free, capable of good and evil, that he has given all of them that good sense, which is the instinct of man and on which the law of nature is founded. Such a one undoubtedly has religion and a much better religion than all those sects who are beyond the pale of our church. For all these sects are false and the law of nature is true. Thus theism is good sense, not yet instructed by revelation. And other religions are good sense perverted by superstition. All sects differ because they come from men. Morality is everywhere the same because it comes from God. Why out of five or six hundred sects, there have scarcely been any who have not spilled blood. So he says, look what we get from cultic religion. We get the uh, religious wars 
of the 16th and 17th century is what we wind up with. And he wanted to oppose a, a principle of morality against the dogma of revealed religion. What religion would be the least objectionable? Would it not be that which should be the simplest, that which should teach much morality and very few dogmas, that which should tend to make men just without making them absurd, that which should not ordain the belief of things impossible, contradictory, injurious to the divinity and pernicious to mankind, nor dare to threaten with eternal pains whoever should possess common sense. So he would say, why are the Jesuits persecuting me? He says, because they are superstitious leftovers from a dark and clouded age. And on the American side of the pond, we have as a um, spokesperson, two generations younger than Voltaire, by the way, um, a spokesperson for the Enlightenment ideal of, of deism, which was the common belief system of a very large swath of the founding fathers uh, in the American colonies. Uh, Payne becomes a, a classic spokesperson because he publishes a couple of pamphlets on the issue, uh, one of which called Common Sense, another one called the American Crisis. Uh, Payne was the premier popularizer of universal human rights. His essay, The Age of Reason, from which this excerpt was taken, was the quintessential deist tract. I believe in one God and no more. And I hope for happiness beyond this life. I believe in the equality of man. And I believe that religious duties consist in doing justice, loving mercy, and endeavoring to make our fellow creatures happy. But I do not believe in the creed professed by the Jewish church, by the Roman church, by the Greek church, by the Turkish church, by the Protestant church, nor by any church that I know of. My own mind is my own church. All national institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, uh, for Turkish read Muslim, by the way, appear to be no other than human inventions, right? Cultic artifacts of cultures, particular cultures, set up to terrify and enslave mankind and monopolize power and profit. The adulterous connection of church and state, whether it had taken place, whether Jewish, Christian, or Turkish, had so effectually prohibited uh, by pains and penalties every discussion upon established creeds and upon first principles of religion, that until the system of government should be changed, those subjects could not be brought fairly and openly before the world. You need a revolution first. But that whenever this should be done, a revolution in the system of religion would follow. Human inventions and priestcraft would be detected, and man would return to the pure, unmixed, and unadulterated belief of one God and no more. Every national church or religion has established itself by pretending some special mission from God communicated to certain individuals. The Jews have their Moses, the Christians their Jesus Christ, their apostles and saints, and the Turks their Muhammad, as if the way to God was not open to every man alike. Each of these churches, each of those churches, shows certain books, uh, which they call Revelation or the Word of God. And so you get this sort of essential uh, deistic position of the world, uh, which is not the way the founding fathers usually portrayed, but certainly would have characterized uh, the minds of people like Jefferson and Franklin. But this issue of the classical world pitted against the medieval world as a cultural model uh, received probably uh, its most uh, famous expression by the great English historian of the Roman world, Edward Gibbon, uh, who I believe was born the same year that Paine is. And in his 
wonderful history, the masterful history, the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, uh, which still stands up to reading, by the way. It's still, even when it's wrong, it's so well written, it's wonderful. Gibbon attributed the collapse of the Roman Empire and the ushering in of the, what he called the rubbish of the dark ages to the corrupting influence of Christianity. And a quote, as the happiness of the future life is the great objection of religion, is the great object of religion, excuse me, we may hear without surprise or scandal that the introduction or at least the abuse of Christianity had some influence on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The clergy successfully preached the doctrines of patience and pusillanimity, cow coward, cowardice and, and uh, lack of military muscle. The active virtues of society were discouraged. The last remains of military spirit were buried in the cloister. A large portion of public and private wealth was consecrated to the specious demands of charity and devotion, and the soldier's pay was lavished on the useless multitudes of both sexes who could only plead the merits of abstinence and chastity, the monks and the nuns. The sacred indolence of the monks was devoutly embraced by a servile and effeminate age. You have to admit, he could write his comment on the classical period in Rome, in contrast, is, is quite uh, different in spirit. He describes the Rome of the second century, 100 to 200, actually 96 to 200, as the gold standard of human civilization. If a man were called, this is probably the most famous quote, in the entire six volumes of the history. If a man were called to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would without hesitation name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. Domitian uh, comes to the imperial throne in 96 AD and Commodus, uh, who is the son, the sort of the decadent son of Marcus Aurelius is often thought of as the usher in of the uh, collapse of the golden age of the emperors. The vast extent of the Roman empire was governed by absolute power under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. The armies were restrained by the firm but gentle hand of four successive emperors whose characters and authority commanded involuntary respect. The forms of the civil administration were carefully preserved by Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonines, who delighted in the image of liberty and were pleased with considering themselves as the accountable ministers of the laws. And I made one mistake up above. Uh, Domitian dies in 96, the, the, the so-called last uh, bad emperor of the first, the Julio-Claudians of the early part of the first century, and then the Flavians, uh, Titus, Vespasian, and Domitian. But after that, from Nerva on, the, the imperial throne becomes a kind of, uh, it's not an inherited throne anymore. It becomes the decision of um, certain power centers like the army, and you kind of get an elected emperor, if you will, even if the electoral college is fairly small, but you, you get for the next century emperors who were chosen like, like uh, Trajan, like Hadrian, like uh, Antoninus Pius, like Marcus Aurelius, who were chosen for their abilities from the ranks of, of the military leadership. Um, and he says, this is the happiest period that the Western world has ever seen, in his words. So already you have this idealization of classicism and this minimalization of the medieval world as dark, superstitious, 
and and lodged in a smoky mystery as opposed to um, beatific, light-filled, airy reason, which the modern world, they think, is a resumption of from the classical world. The argument is we are returning. We deviated uh, because of this warping by uh, the Judeo-Christian Muslim domination of of Europe and and the Near East for a number of centuries. And now, now we in the West are returning to the tradition of, of light and clarity that was the heritage of the Greco-Roman world. A man who had much to do with the cult of classicism uh, is a German who worked in the Vatican, uh, Johann Joachim Winkelmann, a a spectacular influence on the history of archeology. span It was under his guidance that the initial digs at Pompeian Herculaneum Uh, were begun, and he was a classifier of art that really became the foundation of what we think of as modern art history. He was the first man to say the art of a period is a lens for the entire uh, culture and sensibility of that period, and that you read history and reading the art, that it has to be organized to look at the the shape of what the art in a given period has in common. It speaks to us of the past. So he developed the first modern methods for documenting and categorizing uh, the digs, the ancient artifacts and and art. And he's considered the father of it all. He published the first reports of the discoveries of all the digs around Naples. Uh, He wrote a famous book, uh, the history of art in antiquity, Geschichte der Kunst des Altertums, and 1764, that gets translated into every language, European language, and, and some non European languages. And it's a comprehensive chronological account of Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Etruscan art through which he constructed a lens for understanding the organic growth and decline of each civilization. It became this lens for reading historical movement. Uh, The poster child, in his view, of enlightened art was the Greek world, uh, about which he had much to say. He saw classical Greece as a civilization of harmony, humanism, and rationality. In fact, one could argue that he's most responsible for this view of sort of Athenian high culture and Hellenistic high culture that comes really down to us still as this kind of perhaps oversimplified but idealized vision of of this world in which they began to get things right. Um, and and, And as a model of what we should get back to. And he argued for the imitation of the classics by modern artists. This is something they should be doing, but it should be slavish. As I say here, uh, convinced of the superiority of ancient and and, and mainly Greek art, Winkelmann advocated for a theory of imitation, nach among in German, that doesn't copy, but creates something new in the spirit of the original. So don't copy it, but but be informed by the attitudes uh, implicit in that tradition. The one way for us to become great, perhaps inimitable, is by imitating the ancients. And in a very famous phrase, noble simplicity and quiet grandeur, he characterized all of particularly Greek art and German, the Edle Einfalt und Stille Größe. And, and, and we will see how neoclassicism aspires to this kind of noble simplicity and quiet grandeur. So when we think of as Georgian 
art in in the United Kingdom in the 18th century. Th these are going to be um, the characteristics. So Winkelmann is going to be in the backs of the minds of anyone doing art, architecture, um, or poetry, really, in, the, in this period. Now, I want to talk for a moment about the background the antecedents to this moment of neoclassicism to show where it was coming from. And, and the primary antecedent is the Baroque art of the beginning in the late 16th century and extending all the way into the early 18th century in one form or another. But the early Baroque period, which arose as a response, the Roman church's response to the challenges of the Protestant Reformation, Protestant revolt, if you will, that Baroque art was a message-based art. The buildings are monumental. They suggest hierarchy. They suggest mystical Catholicism. It's the church's militant statement against the Protestants to the North. They double down on everything that Luther and Calvin were accusing them of. You accuse us of having a cult of the saints? We'll show you cult of the saints. You accuse us of having a hierarchical church with a kind of assumed royalty for the top level of the papacy? We'll show you, as you can see in this facade of St. Peter's with apostles standing on the top of the facade. This is, this is a thrust. This is a sword pointed north in the early Baroque period. Its other manifestations, of course, were that mysticism that I was talking about. Again, a doubling down on a uh, the interior lives of these idealized saints. And you get a Baroque artist like Francisco de Zubaran, the Spanish, the great Spanish artist, perhaps the greatest of the Baroque artists, um, aside from Caravaggio. Uh, but his, his sequences of St. Francis in this period, using that chiaroscuro, the dark light, techniques of Caravaggio. Uh, these are the messages, you know, dripping in incense in the image, dripping of hidden wells of power. Think of this as contrasted to those simple, stripped down uh, Calvinist reformed churches in Switzerland or, or in, in Scotland, uh, where there were just pews and simple burghers sitting in those pews. Um, Zurbaran, yeah, I left that in R, thank you. <laughs> um, but think of the contrast with the Protestant iconography of the period. And here in this slide, uh, a painting that reflects uh, the ceilings that you would have found. This is actually a painting, but that reflects the ceilings you would have found in almost every Jesuit church of the period in which Mary or Ignatius Loyola or some other major figure, uh, notably, notably not Christ himself, as you would have found in a Greek church, the, the Pantocrator uh, of, of, of the royal Jesus in the dome. These are visions usually of Mary and the saints because they, uh, they speak of intercession and the cult of priesthood. There is God, if you see it in the top of the painting, and there's the Holy Spirit in the shape of the dove, uh, faintly represented through a glass distantly. But here's Mary in a kind of bright centrality. And this is probably Ignatius that looks like a Jesuit habit over here. These are probably other 
uh, Jesuits over here. Um, these are pathways. The priesthood, it's the Roman church's message against Protestantism. Um, we stand as the institution that you go through to get to God. So again, monumentality, mysticism, and, and hierarchy uh, as expressions of early Baroque. The later Baroque, by the time we get into the 18th century, later Baroque, which is often referred to as Rococo, is, uh, has lost the edge. The wars of religion are past. Europe is entering a period of sustained growth and relatively speaking, political stability. There's still wars, but they're, 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 they're wars of, of uh, seeking control of particular thrones in particular countries and the like. It's not the world war of the 30 years war. And the art of the period without this, this thrust, without this edge, without this purpose or, or, or statement of, of, of religious power is characterized quite in opposition to the earlier tradition by ornamentation, extreme or ornamentation, breezy lightness, whimsy, exuberance, asymmetry. The religious subjects have lost their passion and immediacy. And what you're left with, if you, if you look at the court chapel of, at Würzburg, this from 1740, this is not uncommon. This kind of Rococo frou-frou that becomes almost a decorative art. I mean, here's a church that looks like the writing cabinet. Or, or you've got the Fragonards, the, 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 the famous swing uh, painting. It's, it's busy. It's whimsical at best. Uh, but at heart, it's a kind of decorative art. And then in the middle of this, you get Winkelmann dropping his bomb. We need classical models. Let's cut out the frou-frou. And neoclassicism is born. So you have, um, of course, the influence of science still as well in the period. Uh, the Enlightenment regarded the scientific explosion as a return to the sensibility of the classical period, a time before the shadow of the Middle Ages darkened the mind of Europe, the New Age was neoclassical as they begin uh, to refer to it themselves. As a counterpoint to the Rococo, I took a page from Winkelmann and returned to principles that he argued were, were the essential classical principles of simplicity and clarity. So you get a subject matter. I, I used uh, Jacques-Louis David uh, because he becomes the by far the most uh, representative painter of the period. And he does a number of these. This is the Oath of Horatio. Horatio is going to go to the bridge and defend Rome. Uh, so you get these heroic motifs, Mercury. And this could, I mean, look, look at the Mercury. This, this could have been, and you get Canova later on in the period doing statuary that looked like it could have been uh, a Roman reproduction of a Greek model. And even when they turn to modern subjects, uh, even when they try to, to lionize the heroic motifs of the classical world, with, for instance, Napoleon in this wonderful uh, portrait by Ang in, after he declared himself the emperor, uh, this is something that. Um, any of the Judeo, excuse me, the Julio-Claudian emperors would have found uh, totally acceptable. Caesar Augustus would have found this if they had these painting techniques back then, uh, a perfectly just representation of, of the authority and majesty of his position. So this is very much with classical models at heart. And of course, I had to include uh, this painting of the death of Socrates by David because it is probably 
both in theme and representation of, of the stylistic representation, it's probably the perfect, if you were looking for the textbook expression of neoclassicism, here you have the saint of classical rationality, Socrates, forced into a sentence, a court-ordered suicide by the forces of, of uh, parochial, narrow religious belief. He was corrupting, as they argued, the minds of the young people with his pursuit of truth. Uh, here he is standing against the forces of darkness, totally calm. Give me my cup of hemlock. He's the only one not distressed in the entire painting. He is the soul of classical calmness. He is the stoic. He is uh, the perfect expression of what the Enlightenment ethically decided the mind of the philosopher should be as, as, as brave, as calm, as secure in the universal principles that he sees before his eyes so clearly that he doesn't turn a hair in contemplating uh, his imminent death and accepting it. So it, it becomes the poster of enlightenment identity. In this period, as well, of course, in, in, and I'm turning to England here, by 1760, and remember, uh, the, the Socrates was dated 1787. From 1760 on, industrialization, the so-called industrial revolution in England and Scotland had reached uh, what the economic historian W.W. W. Rostow refers to as, as the takeoff period. It reached critical mass. In other words, it was able to sustain itself. It didn't need new inputs or new markets to discover. There, there was a lifting of the entire material base of production by 1760. And here you have Joseph Wright, an English painter, from Darby, and he creates a kind of sensation in the art world because he takes all these neoclassical techniques and assumptions and attitudes, but he, instead of Horatio at the bridge, instead of Cincinnatus uh, taken from behind the plow, instead of, of you know, a god, uh, a Roman god uh, in, in meditation, we have scenes of industry and scenes of science depicted in that same neoclassical style. So here we have an iron forge, uh, which would have really piqued the interest, I'm sure, of industrialists around. I wonder where he sold most of his paintings. I could see somebody in Manchester uh, in the North really wanting to hang that in their house. And here is this wonderful painting. And, and, and look at the paintings, the, the, the chiaroscuro effects and the faces of the children. Uh, it's a philosopher lect lecturing on the orrery. This is physical science. This is the, uh, an orrery is the device to show the uh, movement of the planets around the sun. And the, the light source would have been the sun. It's at the center of the orrery. And so we, we get the symbolism of enlightenment from the middle. And, and here is um, the neoclassical presentation of it. And down here, we have an experiment on a bird in, in an air pump. So here, science is being done. Uh, these are the new heroes. The, 
these are the new Scipio Africanuses. These are the new Fabius Maximuses of the, of the modern classical period as, as industrialization takes root. Now, of course, as you're well aware, the extension of all these principles uh, to architecture uh, created what we still consider as uh, masterpieces of the 18th century. The, I, I, on this slide, I'm showing you the Petit Trianon at Versailles, which was that little retreat that the uh, consorts of Louis the 15th and 16th used as their little hideaway. So it was used as a respite by Madame Pompadour and Madame du Barry, uh, Marie Antoinette later on. It was designed and built 1768 on Jacques Gabriel, principal architect of Louis the 15th. And look at the lines, what Winkelmann called noble simplicity and quiet grandeur. None of that rusting argument that you get from the Baroque facades. This is clean. It's in, in a kind of state of equipoise. There's wonderful balance. There's a quietness and meditative quality. And in the interior, we see the same thing, this, this quiet elegance, it's very grand. The kitchen. So now we're upstairs, downstairs, we're now downstairs and, and it shares the kind of simplicity and elegant lines that, that the lords and ladies would have seen upstairs. So spectacular building. And uh, the man in England, the Anglo-Scottish architect, Robert Adam, who became the most renowned of the Georgian architects, of which there were a number, including his brother, uh, and his creations in England are of the most famous country houses, for instance, but more than country houses, um, still visited today. So you see Kettleston Hall and, and Derbyshire. You see the Pulteney Bridge in Bath, uh, this wonderful um, answer to the Ponte Vecchio over the Arno, done, done with classical taste. And there are little shops, of course, you know, on top of the bridge. And, and a front, and whoops, I meant to go the other way. And the front and back of Harewood House in Yorkshire, uh, grand buildings, which began to reflect the prosperity of the period to, to build on this scale and not be a king. Uh, is something that you find in the 18th century. And of course, uh, the interiors of Robert Adam uh, reflected the same kind of elegance. I love this Osterley Park interior. You can imagine that, that any building along Park Avenue or on the Upper West Side that was built in the 1920s would aspire to have this as a lobby. Um, I don't know where you put the elevators without spoiling the effect or the mailboxes, but, but it becomes the perfect entryway. Uh, Kettleston Hall, the marble ballroom becomes uh, a little showy because of, of the multi-tone marble holding up the classical pillars. And oh, again, I'm jumping too quickly here. And down here, this interior of Cyan House and particularly the the hominess of the Harewood House interiors, the library, um, the hallway, this little fireplace area. These are um, suddenly, as opposed to the Rococo or even the, 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 the early Baroque, these are now interiors that our sensibility uh, finds in wonderfully good taste. We don't look at these and say, oh, how dated. Uh, 
but we look at them and say, how modern, how elegant. Uh, perhaps it isn't Bauhaus, but I certainly like the warmth of the library with its so what they would have called the turkey carpet on the floor and the writing desk. And outside, we have gardens. And the garden architects, uh, the one most famous, Lancelot, so-called Capability Brown, who did almost all of the big houses. He was like a one-man band. Uh, you see the assumptions of what gardens should look like. They're measured. Uh, they're geometrical. They, they create vistas. They, they're, they're decorative without being Rococo over the top. They use uh, Greek and Roman references outdoors. Here's the Palladian Bridge at Stowe. They use color. They are not meant to be nature as such, but a decorative element that becomes an extension of the house pointed to nature. And, and as we get to nature in any of, of these Georgian uh, treasures, what we get is the park, the neoclassical park, the park beyond the garden, which is meant deliberately to be a depiction of nature, but it's not meant to be natural in the raw sense. Nature, nature, like the state of nature for Hobbes, was considered to be nasty, brutish, and short. It was the nature of hurricanes and, and monstrosities, if you will. This is nature as filtered through the organized, uh, orderly vision of the human mind. In other words, it is artificial, a word that they would have taken as a compliment. It meant that you took the raw thing and through art, artifice, the making of art, art, ars facere, okay? That you make something that the mind can see as a, you, you impose human order. You, you do what God did to the universe. You impose the will of order. And, and so the pleasant fields, the orchestration, it's, it's, it's of course, a, a very short walk in the park from here to um, Central Park or, or any of the Olmsted parks of the 19th century, which are, of course, artificial. You destroy shanty towns, you bring in rocks, you plant trees, uh, you create orientations, you angle the house towards the park or the park towards the house, you create hills when needed, uh, you, you figure out what ought to have been the case and you make it so. So the park is nature elevated by art. The last topic in talking about the return to classical models is the 18th century interest in obsession with looking towards the ancients as models for what government should be. And it began with Aristotle who created a template for understanding forms of government. So in the fourth century BC, Aristotle develops a template for summarizing the possible forms of government in their benevolent 
and corrupt manifestations. In other words, he says there's three kinds of government, the rule of one, the rule of a small group, or the rule of everybody. Those are the three main forms. Each of those forms has a good version and a corrupt or bad version. And so I, in this template up in the upper right, uh, the w- single ruler, the ideal version, of course, is kingship, which suggests a benevolent monarch. The bad or deviant version is the tyrant. If you have a few rulers ruling in the interest of everybody, ideally, you call it an aristocracy, the aristoi, the rule of the best. If it's deviant or decadent or corrupt, it's an oligarchy. It's the Politburo. If the rule of many, when it's done as it was in Periclean Athens, for instance, he calls a polity, he reserves the word for democracy, demos, for him, for Aristotle, suggested the mob. Then it's the, it's the Athens of Cleon the tyrant after the death of Pericles in, in the middle of the Peloponnesian War. These forms of government, Aristotle pointed out, are inherently unstable. So each form, each form is based on a social class, if you will. They tended to excesses and therefore sudden swings into other forms. So for instance, democracy, uh, when it really started sinking into the depths, would degenerate into demagoguery and tyranny. And there's much discussion of this in uh, the modern world now, is there not, in our own modern world now? So it can degenerate into, into and morph into strange kinds of mob rule. A Hellenistic historian and political theorist named Polybius, who lived in the middle of the second century, at the point at which the Roman Republic, still a republic, had expanded to occupy almost the entire Italian, by this point, the entire Italian peninsula and Sicily and parts of North Africa and nearby Spain had expanded into what was left of the Greek city-state world within his lifetime. And he, fully aware of Aristotle's analysis of the forms of government and the inherent instability in all of those forms, he asked himself the question, how come the Roman Republic was so successful and still did not seem to have lost its internal bearings. It hasn't gone off the deep end. It hasn't succumbed to either mob rule or the rule of an, a tyrannical uh, king or dictator. Um, how come they still maintained their Republican mix and managed to expand and dominate almost the entire Mediterranean region. What's the secret of their success? And he concluded that it was because the Romans, the Republic had a mixed constitution. It had the consulate, which was like an executive. And from which, by the way, in in times of emergency, a dictator, that's their word, a dictator, could be empowered for a very short period of time to declare martial law and to lead the troops to safety and then return to the limited consular role that that the, the Roman constitution prescribed for them. And then there was the Roman Senate, in which all the great families were represented as as a kind of an aristocracy, a Roman aristocracy. And then there were the assemblies of the plebs, the the comitia. Uh, And that this mix, 
provided stability and imperial success because it created a set of checks and balances that each unit had over the others. So the pleb assemblies had the right to elect a tribune who could veto laws passed by the Senate if indeed they were deemed extreme, et cetera. So there were, there were implicit and explicit limitations of each governmental role in this mixed constitution. Each estate had rights that represented its class interests and served as a counter to the excesses of the others. And the leaders of each of these estates were elected internally by their own group. Cicero, now at the point, a century later, at the point that the Republic is collapsing, despite his best efforts, he was the last defender, if you will, of the prerogatives of the Senate. He is a grand traditionalist. He sees the Roman Republic collapsing around him under the influence of, of Julius Caesar, particularly. And it's collapsing under the weight and, and wealth of its own success. And it's about to morph, I would say in his lifetime, but he's killed before the final morphing. He, he, he's killed by uh, representatives of, of, of Mark Antony. Uh, that the Emperor Augustus, Octavian, the nephew of Julius, the adopted grand nephew of Julius Caesar, comes and establishes uh, the imperial structure that, that replaces the Republic of Rome. But he, in his writings, was the synthesis of all the old traditions, and he studied Greek philosophy. People in Cicero's class went to Athens the way people in, in 18th century London or 19th century New York went to Paris to study this, you know, the, the, the central seat of civilization at the time and, and imbued with Greco-Roman philosophy and the Roman Republican traditions. Cicero created an idealized image of Republican government in his, his version of the Republic, De Republica, that served as a manual for enlightenment political theory. So you have this work done in the ancient world, picked up by the enlightenment, particularly by a man who becomes uh, the advocate of ancient constitutional theory and he is uh, Charles-Louis de, uh, de Seconda, who is the Baron de Montesquieu. He is one of the most influential figures of the Enlightenment. He's a French aristocrat. He's been carefully educated in, in Latin and, and Greek classics. He's done a close reading of Roman and Greek political theory, and he writes this masterpiece called The Spirit of the Laws, which everyone who had aspirations to political theory in the 18th century, whether they were in, in St. Petersburg, whether they were in Warsaw, whether they were in New York, whether they were in Mexico City, whether they were in Paris, Everyone read this book. Everyone was familiar with this book. And his arguments for constitutional government, uh, separation of powers and civil liberties, and that included the abolition of slavery, about which he was quite outspoken, informed every new revolutionary and reform movement. And in the latter half of the 18th century, there was this frenzy of constitution writing. Poland, which had a very ineffectual uh, form of government that was built around uh, all in, the, in, their, in their, con their constituent body. I don't, I don't even remember what the name of it was, but their deliberative body 
every representative had the so-called liberum veto. That meant anybody saying no to a law, it sounds like our House of Representatives today, doesn't it? Anybody, anybody who could say no could stop the passage of a bill. And so realizing the plight they were in, the government of Poland actually had a contest inviting everyone in Europe to submit new constitutions. Rousseau was one of those people. And we'll talk about that in one of the future sessions. Uh, who decides, okay, I'll take a shot at writing the constitution for Poland. But of course, obviously, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the French Revolution and the Constitution of the United States is, is written in this period. The discussions of the American founding fathers, as I put in this star bullet in the middle there, presumed an intimate familiarity with Montesquieu and, and all of his classical antecedents. The curriculum for the educated class in the 18th century centered on classical studies. You knew your Latin and Greek. You certainly knew your Latin. And if you were Thomas Jefferson, you also knew your Greek. And of course, you absolutely knew your lingua franca, you knew your French, because that was the, the center of publishing and, and intellectual thought in the period. So here we have Montesquieu uh, talking about the separation of powers. In every state, there are three kinds of power, the legislative authority, the executive authority for things that stem from the law of nations, and the executive authority for those that stem from civil law, what we would call the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. By virtue of the first, the prince of, or magistrate enacts laws. By the second, he makes peace or war, sends or receives embassies, establishes the public security, and provides against invasions. By the third, he punishes criminals or determines the disputes that arise between individuals. The latter we shall call the judiciary power and the other simply the executive power of the state. When the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, there can be no liberty because apprehensions may arise lest the same monarch or senate should enact tyrannical laws to execute them in a tyrannical manner. Again, there is no liberty if the power of judging be not separated from the legislative and executive powers. So here at Montesquieu, you, you, you get all the fundamental discussions of, 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 of exactly way, the categories in which government should be laid out based on the original template of Aristotle, filter through the mixed constitution theories of Polybius and um, Cicero, and then picked up again with glee by Montesquieu and uh, the philosophes of the Enlightenment. And our final slide, we're gonna end a little early today is I wanted to talk about the Federalist Papers because the American Constitution, uh, while it was under discussion and being hammered out, there, there was a, a pamphlet discourse sponsored and, and, and really uh, mostly written by Alexander Hamilton, but along with James Madison, one of the future presidents, but of the same generation as Hamilton, uh, both of whom were schooled, in, even though Hamilton was something of a self-educated man, but Madison was a you know, well-born son of Virginia who would have had the right tutelages uh, as a child. And they were well-schooled in ancient and modern literatures of, of government. And they would have read their Montesquieu. And so in Federalist 47, the pamphlets are numbered. This one was written by Madison in 1788. And it's entitled The Particular Structure of the New Government and the Distribution of Power Among Its Different Parts. And 
lifted straight out of Montesquieu, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Were the federal constitution therefore really chargeable with the, with the accumulation of power or with a mixture of powers having a dangerous tendency to such an accumulation, no further arguments would be necessary to inspire a universal repro reprobation of the system. I persuade myself, however, that it will be made apparent to everyone that the charge cannot be supported and that the maxim on which it relies has been totally misconceived and misapplied. In order to form correct ideas on this important subject, it will be proper to investigate the sense in which the preservation of liberty requires that the three great departments of power should be separate and distinct. The oracle who is always consulted and cited on this subject is the celebrated Montesquieu. If he be not the author of this invaluable precept in the science of politics, he has the merit at least of displaying and recommending it most effectually to the attention of mankind. So, so here we've come full circle. Uh, the ancient world has set up standards uh, for the pursuit of science, for the pursuit of art, for the pursuit of government. These are models that, that would have perhaps been achieved fully at a much earlier point in historical time, were it not for the uh, negative intrusion of medieval Christianity and its obsession with, with uh, cultic religion that produced a, a clouding of the mind and a desire to pursue, uh, if you will, intellectual voodoo, as they would have seen it, uh, instead of sticking closely to principles of clarity, uh, proper investigation, universal objectivity, um, and what they call particularly in, in the Anglo-Scottish world, common sense. And it was implicitly, they didn't have to talk about it much. It was implicitly the attitude that was going to inform the confidence that the enlightenment had, that they were on uh, the proper course in retrospect, we could see it as a kind of a smugness, perhaps. Uh, they, they, we, we could argue that, that it ignored uh, some of the dark sides of, of human nature. If indeed we ask the Greek world to comment on, on the enlightened world, they would have said, ah, you've, you've read your Aristotle and your Plato very well, but you've ignored your Euripides. You, you ignored your irrationality and tragic flaws that are at the root of, of the human personality, perhaps. But th these are themes that we're going to be looking at as, as we go forward over the next few weeks. With that done, I am going to stop the share. And remove the pin. And here we are. So uh, way early, I'm about 15 minutes early <laughs> this week.
But anybody want to talk about any aspect of that? Or well, I have a question. I, I have a question. So what was the impact on the average person of this highfalutin language and philosophy and thought and everything? I mean, how did it impact, you know, did people stop going to churches and stop practicing religion or, you know, what was, what, how did normal people or regular people, um, you know, deal with all this? Or was it just the philosoph and the, you know, intellectuals of the period who, you know? Well, it depends where you are. Mm -hmm. um, in Eastern Europe, there's still a serf tradition in this period. In, in the West, in France, um, you get a very, for instance, it's, it's a very mixed population because they're not in the throes of a, uh, the same kind of economic expansion that the English and Scots are in at this time. Uh, and then you get a kind of an extreme version in the American colonies where you only have a thin intellectual elite and a very dominant, what we would consider a literate middle class of substantial size in the, in the colonies uh, by virtue of the fact that there had been, and I'm not talking about the South where, where there was the institution of slavery, but in the Northern colonies where there was a labor shortage. And so you get a lot of people who had to receive a minimum of education. Um, literacy rates at the colonies were much higher than they were in, in, in England, for instance. Um, this is all by way of saying Depending where you were, it was broader than just a thin intellectual class, but it certainly did not, you know, stop church going and the like. Uh, but it did inform it did inform the formation of state governments, mm -hmm. and certainly. So, if you look at the French Revolution and the American Revolutions, you could see how this thinking, in one form or another, touched a lot of people not necessarily in the best ways, but you, you probably, in, by 1792, in France, I'm sure you had people in the streets with their own pocket versions of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, <laughs> making arguments that they may not have understood very well, but, but all the same, uh, there had been some filtering down. So it's a mixed bag. Right. I would also say that um, you'll get an interesting take on things when we get to the final session where I talk about, the final two sessions where I talk about movements that are counter enlightenment movements, both political and, and artistic. And, and, and you'll, you'll see that they infiltrate public discourse, probably they penetrate further than enlightenment theory does, mm -hmm. we'll say. Anybody else? So next week, let me see, what did I set the... So next week, I'm gonna be talking about the Enlightenment as a social movement and attitudes of, of progress, perfectibility and, and confidence. And, and to some degree, I'll answer better some of Debbie's questions. This is a period in which the expansion of broadside newspapers, for instance, developed dramatically in uh, the big urban centers of Western Europe so that 
literacy expanded significantly. And, and a lot of these broadsides would have been political. They would have been attacks on members of certain parties. They would have been attacks on or promotions of, of all sorts of things. There were, there were probably... There were probably in London, there were probably several dozen publications a day of different broad, broadside sheets, one page penny papers that would have been distributed in the streets. And sometimes, you know, they'd get nailed to a tavern door and one of the, liter the literate guys in the tavern would read it to the, to the gang Certainly in the coffee house culture, but this is what I'm talking about next week. In the coffee house culture and in the pub culture, the, the, the tavern cultures and the cafe cultures of all of Western Europe, this became, and the club culture, this became the foundation of the newly emerging middle class getting a chance to get together and experience themselves as a social class. One could argue that this is the period in which the idea of social class gets invented, by which I mean in a, in a peasant society, in a truly peasant society, which is isolated and which is local, you are a person of that place, of a certain family and of that place. You know, I'm from such and such a place and this is our church and this is, you know, our farm and this is whatever. Once literacy begins to build a little bit, once industrialization seems to build a little bit, you get movement to urban centers where people encounter for the first time more people like themselves, but from different places. And so they, they realize that they are what, what I've just been calling a class. Hey, I'm like this guy. We don't come from the same place. I didn't know there were people like this over there or wherever this guy comes from. But here we are, and, and we have interests in common. I am more like this guy in that I do the same job for a living, and I've got the same objections to how the bosses treat me. I'm more like this guy than I am like the other villagers where I came from, who didn't do the same job as I did. One guy was a miller, and one guy was a baker. And Anyhow, with that done, I Thank will. You. Thank you. I will sign us off. I will see you next week. Okay. I just wanted to say, oh, I was on mute. I'm sorry. That it seems to me that all of these broadsheets were sort of designed to appeal to certain groups. So, depending where you were in society, you could read or hear a broadside that supported your worldview or your narrow That's right. and much it, it's it's hard not to apply that to the present that's right you had fox news right no exactly so um you know it's happening all over again but that's you know and, but and that's a theme throughout history right true that <laughs> Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Oh, okay, gang. Thank you. Thank you.